Jeez. I don't know how much more of Beth's drama I can take. I mean, I don't know how I got a ticket to ride her emotional roller coaster, but I just want off. Like, for real. When is she just gonna stop being so down in the dumps? Um. I don't think this text was meant for me. Well, this is awkward. Wow, that was awkward. <laughs> Liz needs to learn to check this, the, the, the two box before you hit send. If there's anything that we've all pulled away from this series, let's double check before we send a text just because that was incredibly awkward. How's everyone doing tonight? <laughs> It's so good to be here. My name is Jen. I'm the worship pastor here um, at 2911, and I'm so excited to be closing out our Awkward series. And you know what? I'm, I feel really honored to be a part um, of a church, of a body of believers who aren't afraid to tackle some difficult topics. You know, our pastoral staff is not afraid to talk about some things that are really uncomfortable, and that's what we've been doing um, in this series. And tonight, we're kind of finishing it out with mental health. But the goal of this series has just been to start some conversations, to encourage some conversations conversations, maybe even to build some bridges to some topics that can be challenging to, to, um, to breach. And so there's no way that we can thoroughly impact all of this in 30 or 40 minutes. But you know what? These talks, these messages, they're just a great starting point. And so I hope that you guys all realize that. Just so that there's no confusion, I'm, I want to be clear what we're going to be focusing on today. The topic of mental health, it is, it's nuanced and it's complex. It's, it's both a personal condition, but it's also kind of a public matter that we're all dealing with. It's, it, there's layers upon layers, and it's impossible for us to really dive into everything in this setting. So we're not going to be spending our time looking in depth at conditions or their causes. That's not what we're going to do. But what we are going to do is we're going to take a look at our body, our soul, and our spirit and the basics of how these three things work together to make up who we are as people. So I want to start out by saying this, that if you're struggling with your mental health, if you, if you have suicidal thoughts or thoughts of self-harm, please reach out to someone. Please reach out. Reach out to a pastor. Reach out to a friend. Reach out to a healthcare professional. Don't isolate yourself and don't try to fight things alone because there's people who want to reach out and want to help you. And on the flip side, if you know someone who's struggling, reach out to them. Reach out to them. Let them know that you care. Let them know that you are there to help support them because that's what we need to do. So today, this message is for all of us, and you might have come into this place or even clicked on this link and thought, oh, you know, mental health, I don't really know, but I want to tell you that this, there is something in this for all of us, and I want to encourage everyone to really lean in, for us to lean into the Spirit and allow the Lord to kind of shape and maybe even reframe or adjust some of our perspectives and some of the ways that, that maybe we have thought about mental health in the past. As we begin to look at mental health, I feel it's important to say this, that regardless of how mental health issues come about, whether they're the result of hormonal or chemical imbalances, whether they're physiological or psychological deficiencies, traumas or life experiences, the result of choices that we've made or sin patterns in our life, regardless, God cares about our mental well-being. God cares. The Bible doesn't directly address mental health, um, especially in the context that we know it, but there are passages that can give us guidance in how we view the issue. We have to study and understand God's character and his heart, and that's woven all throughout Scripture, and, and that will help us with topics that can seem kind of ambiguous in the Word. There's multiple passages in the Bible that, that point to the everlasting and the unchanging nature of God, the consistency of God. Malachi 3.6 says, for I, the Lord, do not change. He never changes. He is who he says he is. And so while we might not be able to find a specific passage on mental health, we do know one thing. The character and the nature of God never change. They never change. He is and he always will be a God who sees us, who cares for us, and who loves us. Always. 
God cares about every single person on the planet, no matter what they're facing, no matter what they're struggling with, whatever they're battling through or addicted to, he cares. He cares. And this has to be our foundation, especially if we're believers. If we don't believe that God cares deeply for people, from the homeless person up the street to the highest government official, from the orphan in Uganda to that manager at our job that we just can't stand, it, listen, if we don't believe that God cares and that he has compassion and mercy for the people that are in our lives, then we're going to be crippled in our ability to be a reflection of him in our world. Here are just a few passages, just a few, and I said it's all over the scripture, but just a few, scra- uh, a few passages that communicate God's heart for the world. John 3, 16 says, For this is how God loved us. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Romans 5, 8, But God clearly shows and proves his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Everyone. God loves and cares for all people, and his heart is that everybody will come to repentance and salvation in him. God has made atonement for every single person on the planet through the death of Jesus Christ. He's made a way for the forgiveness of sins, for healing, for mercy, and for grace, because that's who he is. That's who he is. But it's on us. It's on people. It's on individuals to reach out and accept that gift of salvation and redemption through the repentance of their sins and through the surrender of their lives to him. So what's our role then? What's our role as believers? Well, I said earlier, we're supposed to be a reflection of God, of his character on the earth. And no, that's not easy. That is not easy at all because situations, they're complex. Sin is grievous. Immorality is all around us and people are wounded and they're hurting and they're broken. And those things can make it hard for us to navigate the issues around us. And that's why it's important for us to have the foundation of God's character and his heart at the root of everything that we do. Now, don't get me wrong. The foundation of God's love um, is not saying that we are passive or we're permissive when it comes to sin. That's not at all what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that God's love should set the tone for how we view people and handle situations all around us. God's love has to set the tone. It's his love that sent Jesus to the cross. The very people that whipped and beat and mocked Jesus were the very people that God was making a way to redeem. They were the very people that God was redeeming. And that's what we have to remember, especially when we're addressing the topics that we've talked about in this series. They're difficult topics, but we have to remember that, that God loves everyone, period. Our foundation has to be God's love. It has to be. I think it's not going to come as a surprise to anyone um, that mental health has become a very real issue that I think the big C church has to address and we have to help support. At 2911, our heart is to be compassionate and caring to those who are dealing with mental health crises and to become um, a conduit of God's health, of his healing, of his mercy, of his grace. We want to be vessels that God flows through to help people so that they don't feel alone, so they don't feel isolated and have to struggle and face things by themselves. Our head pastor, as well as our pastoral staff, we believe in this so much that we are planning and hoping and preparing for a mental health branch of ministry here at this church. We actually have a group of people right now who are going through training to become certified as mental health um, advocates and, and crisis responders and coaches. They're getting certified so that they can help bring very practical support and spiritual support to people. As a church, we cannot just turn a blind eye. We can't. And we have to be able to offer more than just a blanket statement of, I'll be praying for you. We have to have more than that. Sometime during the 1950s and 60s, when psychiatric medicines and treatments became more readily available, people began to adopt the mindset that counseling was only for the severely afflicted individuals, and thus the stigma 
attached to professional counseling and treatment, it was kind of propelled. It was already there, but it kind of gained some momentum. And through the decades, it's changed a bit. Um, but if you're someone who wonders about the validity of professional counseling, I want to assure you that counseling, especially Bible-based, faith-based counseling, is a good thing. It's a good thing. The book of Proverbs alone references the, the value of counsel, of wise counsel over and over again. God has gifted counselors with the ability to dissect issues. They can analyze traumas. They can provide support for people who are struggling with different elements in life. And so to treat counseling like it's something that only messed up people need, that's an error. That's an error on our part. The Bible tells us to bear one another's burdens, to help carry them. And you know what? That's exactly what counselors do. And I truthfully believe that everybody, everybody can benefit from sitting down and having a conversation with a counselor at least once in life. Everybody can. Over the years, we've seen the church's response to mental health um, issues. They, they've varied from one end of the spectrum to the other. Older generations have tended to not fully embrace or encourage professional counseling at times. They've preferred roots of pastoral guidance and prayer, which is great. Those things are great. They're awesome. But in some situations, it's incomplete. In younger generations, they've tended to embrace clinical diagnoses and prescription medications, but they've at times discredited the power and importance of spiritual health and support. And I think it's important for us as believers to have a complete viewpoint and a complete approach rather than this way or that way. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. According to Light University, this is a Christian organization, and they focus on educating and equipping leaders in biblical counseling and life coaching and crisis response and Christian care. One out of every five individuals in the USA suffers with a mental health problem in a given year. One in every five. That's 46.6 million people. That means that in a room this size, either you or somebody near you is going to face some sort of a mental health issue in this next year. Think about that for just a minute. And if it's not in this year with this statistic, I think it's safe to say that at some point in life, all of us are going to face some sort of a mental health issue, whether it's just a season or it's a lifelong journey that we have to walk. Everybody is probably going to come into contact with this. We all have a body and a mind, and therefore we all have the potential to encounter mental health and disruption because here's the deal. Life gives us the opportunity to face grief and loneliness and stress and anxiety and depression and trauma and sorrow and fear and the like. Life is going to give us all that opportunity. So we all could encounter a mental health disruption at some point. Light University also says that one out of every 25 individuals in the USA is dealing with a serious mental health disorder. One out of every 25. Now, if we think that mental health issues are only a recent development in our society, we're wrong. We're absolutely wrong. The Bible gives several accounts of people who face mental, emotional, and spiritual distress. We know that David struggled through various highs and lows. Um, some would even say he was depressed because he documented it in the Psalms. If you don't believe me, go read the Psalms. David had some serious highs and some lows. King Saul was so mentally and spiritually tormented that he spent years obsessing over David and hunting him down in attempts to kill him. The book of Job details the severe anguish that Job suffered after he faced incredible loss and devastation and grief. Elijah the prophet was so upset in 1 Kings 19 when Jezebel threatened to kill him that he ran out into the wilderness and he prayed and asked God that he would die. Jonah, in Jonah chapter 4, he felt so frustrated that God told, he told God he would rather be dead than alive if his prophecy didn't come true. He was so frustrated and angry. Judas was so guilt-ridden after he betrayed Jesus that he ran out and hanged himself. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 about the hardship that he faced, and he used the metaphor, a thorn in his flesh, and he asked God to just remove it from him. And some of these things, yeah, they can be spiritual. They can be spiritual warfare, but there can also be ele other elements that are at work because life issues are complex. Heath Lambert, who is an author and he's affiliated with the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors, said this, Caring for people means being alert to physical problems that require medical treatments and spiritual problems that require Christ and his word. So how do we approach this? 
How do we handle not only our own mental health struggles, but also help other people around us? Well, I think in order for us to hold a complete viewpoint where we don't demonize one facet of it or discredit another, we have to look at our design as humans. How are we made as humans? And humans are encapsulated in three parts, spirit, soul, and body. We are three parts that make up a whole. Now, if you've been a believer for any time, that should sound kind of familiar to you. I said that we are a reflection of God on this earth, and the Trinity, the Godhead, is three parts that make up one. God the Father, God the Son, that's Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. We are spirit, soul, and body. Our spirit, that's our God consciousness. It's our awareness and sensitivity, our understanding and motivation as it relates to God. It's supernatural, not natural. Our soul is our self-consciousness. That's our mind, our will, our emotions, and it relates to others. It's psychological. And our body is our world consciousness. This is our senses, sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. It's physiological, relating to our environment. And these three elements, they make us up as humans. They can work together for our benefit, or they can war against each other to our detriment. In Galatians 5.17, Paul writes that the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit desires what's contrary to the flesh. And so these two aspects are warring it out. And guess where this battle frequently happens? In our mind, our soul. And that's why Paul writes in Romans 12 too that we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind because our flesh wants to rule our decisions and our spirit wants us to yield to God. It's your flesh that wants you to click on that website late at night when everybody else is asleep. And it's your spirit that's saying, no, 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 don't do it. And it's in our mind where we rationalize and we deliberate and we try to figure out what it is we're gonna do. These three elements, the spirit, the soul, the body, they function almost like a circle together. They're connected with each other and they, they impact the other as we live life. So let's take a look at each area, starting first with the body. Now, this might come as a surprise to you, but our bodies don't always function the way they're designed. For those of you who are over 30, have you tried running lately? Or better yet, doing a somersault. My kids do somersaults all the time. And I'll, it is the most terrifying thing to do as a grown-up. If you don't believe me, go home after church tonight and go do a somersault. It's absolutely terrifying, okay? I don't know what's happening, but it just doesn't happen anymore. Better yet, have you tried losing weight? Come on. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There are so many factors that can impact us physically and physically. Sometimes we're born with deficiencies and challenges. Sometimes we experience changes in our bodies that impact us on a hormonal level or on our body chemistry. And it's because we live in a fallen and broken world. We just do. And sometimes our bodies, they just don't work the way they're supposed to. And the decisions that we make, the decisions and, and the issues that we endure within our physical bodies, they will have an impact on our soul. Sometimes we make choices that feel good on a physical level, um, but they don't really help us on a soul level at all. Um, for example, I'm a coffee lover. I, thank you, thank you. I absolutely love a good cup of caffeine. Really, that's what it comes down to. I don't care if it's iced or hot, if it's drip or cold brew, just give it to me um, because I love it. And sometimes I have the tendency to consume a bit too much in any given day, just a little bit. Often, I do this almost every single day, I do this. And, and here's the thing, it's like in the moment, oh, I am just living my best life, it's fantastic. The aroma is just so pleasing. My taste buds, they are dancing with joy. I'm telling you, life does not get any better than that moment that I'm drinking a cup of coffee. That is until it's 1 a.m. and I can't sleep because I've had way, way too much coffee and I'm jittery. And then when I finally do fall asleep, it's like two seconds later, my alarm goes off and I can't drag myself out of bed. And then I'm unmotivated. I don't want to exercise. I really don't want to read my Bible because I'm tired. And then I'm cranky and my emotions are on edge because I didn't get enough sleep. And so then I'm going to go have extra coffee today because now I'm too tired and it starts all over again. I made a choice in my body that did not serve my soul very well. Now I realize that that's just a really, really small example, but imagine the disservice to our souls when we indulge in toxic relationships, 
in drugs and pornography, in gluttony and self-harm, in alcohol, gossip, sexual temptations. And even further, imagine the damage to our souls when we endure abuse and trauma and difficulties and situations that we didn't choose but were thrust upon us. Regardless of how things come about in life, our souls are impacted by what happens physically to our bodies. And sometimes our bodies need the assistance of medication. Sometimes they need the support of vitamins and supplements. Sometimes they need the regularity of a healthy diet or the discipline of physical exercise or the consistency of proper sleep. What I want to make clear is that all of those things are valid. And it's important for us as individuals to figure out how and where our bodies need support in order to help us function on a healthier level. Most of those areas, if not all of them, they work in conjunction with each other. Some of us need daily medication and supplements to help our bodies function properly. Some of us need to turn off the TV, get off the couch, and go take a walk. Some of us need to skip the drive through go home and make a salad. Some of us just need to drink more water. You're living on iced coffee and Red Bulls, and you can't figure out why you're always wired and frantic and anxious and stressed out. You can't figure it out. Sometimes it's as simple as getting a really, really great night's sleep. And sometimes we need to seek the guidance of a healthcare professional. The bottom line is this, all of those are real and valid. And we shouldn't discredit or disregard them. And we certainly should not shame people or ourselves for doing what is needed to support and strengthen our bodies. That's the bottom line. The second component is our soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. It's our figurative heart, not our literal one. It's the center point of who we are. Our soul, our mind is a powerful thing, and God designed it that way. With our minds, we can imagine incredible works of art. We can, we can build structures and, and, and architecture and buildings that are incredible. We can create systems and processes for organizations. We can write music and poetry and storylines and plays. And with our minds, we can also relive traumas and tragedies. We can replay arguments and failures. We can be tormented by lies and defeats and deceit and be held captive in darkness. Our emotions, these are powerful too. They're helpful. God gave us emotions for a reason. And sometimes they're there to help um, protect us and to warn us. Sometimes they're, they're there to tell us what we need. Sometimes they're there to help us have more compassion on other people. Emotions, they can be confusing and uncomfortable at times, and that's okay. Because there's no wrong emotions. There's no wrong emotions. The thing that we have to remember about emotions is that God designed them to be indicators in our lives. Indicators. Do you guys know that um, everybody that has a car, there's this thing that your car comes equipped with, and it's near the steering wheel, and it's a little lever that sticks out. It's called a turning signal. If you have a car, your vehicle has one of these. And what you do is you press it one way or the other and a light goes off and it helps people around you and even yourself know which way you're about to go. Welcome to my TED talk. So <laughs> bring up the worship team, we're ready to close. No. So I was, I was thinking about turning signals this week. Did you guys know that in the US they're called turning signals but in the UK they're called indicators? They're called indicators. And I thought that that was so fascinating. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's such a perfect word because I would appreciate some indication when someone's gonna change a lane, especially if they're gonna kind of make a quick move in front of me. I drive the US 60 almost on a daily basis and I'm pretty sure that's a signal-free zone. It's, I don't, it's optional, I guess. I mean, I don't know what people are doing on the US 60, but I would appreciate some indication that would really, really help me know where they're going. Oh my goodness, turning signals. <laughs> they help indicate the direction a car is heading. That's what they do, that's their purpose. And emotions can indicate an internal direction. Emotions, they're a powerful tool, but this is what we have to remember when it comes to them. Emotions can help indicate what's going on internally, but we can't allow them to dictate what we do externally. When it comes to our souls, our minds, our emotions, we all have thought patterns and processes that are shaped by what we've learned in life and our experiences, both, bo both good and bad. And they're not always healthy, and they're not always our fault. 
it's good to unpack causes and sources of our thought processes and our emotions with a counselor, but there's still a part that we all have to play. And this is why we hear over and over in the word to guard our hearts. Paul tells us to take thoughts captive, to fix them and focus them because our lives are moving in the direction of our thoughts. Our lives are moving in the direction of our thoughts. And if we just let our mind wander wherever it wants to be or wherever it wants to go, we're going to end up in places where we shouldn't be, where we don't want to go. We replay conversations and injuries and situations from the past in the theater of our mind. And that inhibits us from living in the present and even looking to the future. We watch movies and shows and listen to music that glorify godlessness and immorality, and we call it entertainment. We spend hours reading articles and reports and statistics, and they breed fear and worry and anxiety and doubt in our souls. We scroll aimlessly through social media, consuming the opinions, offenses, and truths of other people. And that allows darkness and confusion and discontentment to creep in. Why are we so lax and casual when it comes to protecting our minds and our souls from dangerous places? If we all saw a small child running out toward the street, I don't think there's any one of us that wouldn't run after them and scream, no, don't go there. Don't go there. You're going to get hurt. Why aren't we that vigilant when it comes to protecting our very own souls? We have to be. I went through a time in my life where I was dealing with some severe hormonal imbalances and my thoughts were just waging war against me. And so I had to put this into practice. There was dozens of times a day I would stop myself and out loud I would go, I have the mind of Christ. I hold the thoughts, feelings, and purposes of his heart. I'm a believer and not a doubter. I hold fast to my confession of faith. I would go through this whole thing over and over every single day to keep my mind from carrying me away to places that were detrimental to to me. Paul writes in Philippians 4, 7, finally believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good report, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things. Center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. We are the gatekeepers of our souls. Our family can't do it for us. Our friends can't do it for us. Our society certainly will not do it for us. It's us. And regardless of where our thoughts stem from, whether they're the result of traumas, imbalances, or just maybe even neglect on our part, we still have to work to guard and protect our minds. We have to fix and fasten our thoughts on the truth of who Jesus is. Listen, we can't always stop a thought from entering the door of our mind, but we can certainly keep it from making itself at home. We certainly can keep it from getting comfortable and grabbing a beverage. (laughs) And finally, the third component is our spirit. Just like what happens in the body affects us on a soul level, the health of our soul can impact our connectivity to the spirit. I can't tell you how many times I sit down to read my Bible and, and, I, and I want to spend some time in prayer, but I, I can't seem to focus. I'm distracted. I'm, I'm emotional. My mind won't cooperate. I'm, I'm exhausted. And that's because my body and my soul and my spirit, they exist in connection with each other. So somewhere something's going on. We're all born with the spirit. Our spirit is a deposit from God, and it's meant to facilitate our personal and our intimate relationship and connection with him. But we have a choice whether or not it fulfills that design. The spirit within us, it lies dormant until we choose whether or not we're going to receive the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ and be reborn in him. And honestly, I think it's an incredible mystery. And truthfully, it's miraculous if you think about that. There's an encounter in John chapter 3 that Jesus has with a man named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus had heard of Jesus' teachings and and the miracles that he was performing. And and he was trying to understand how everything worked together. And so he came to Jesus. And this is part of the conversation they had. It says, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, We all know that God has sent you to teach us. 
Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. The Holy Spirit gives birth to that spiritual, supernatural life within us. And it's the Holy Spirit working inside us to transform us, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to challenge and convict, to teach and build and shape us spiritually. And this is an incredible gift as believers because we don't have to face the heartbreak and the challenges of this life alone. Before our spirit is awakened to life in Christ, we've got nothing but our body and our mind working together or against each other as we navigate life. But when we're born again into new life in Christ, the spirit becomes alive in us and it serves to usher the supernatural power of God into our physical lives. I don't know about you, but I certainly would not have made it through some of the darkest seasons of my life if all I had was my mind and my flesh to get me through it. I would not have made it through if it weren't for the Spirit of God living in me, if it weren't for the hope of Jesus Christ living in me. I wouldn't have made it. And very often, I hear people downplay how our spiritual health and strength are connected to our mental health. And truthfully, our spiritual health is the only facet of our being that is tapped into the supernatural power and presence of God. Pastor Mark started this this series with talking about spiritual maturity, and he used the example of easels, and and, and he, he was talking about God making his masterpiece on the canvas of our lives, that our lives are God's masterpiece. And you know, I'm so grateful that God is the artist because I am not an artist at all. Um, I am really horrible when it comes to art and drawing. In fact, there was this one time when um, I was growing up, my sisters and I were just home during the summer while our mom was at work. And, you know, we would try to come up with ways to entertain ourselves because we weren't allowed to like watch TV or movies during the day. She didn't want us just frying our minds with electronics. And so my younger sister and I one day were like, oh, we're bored. What do you want to do? And we were like, hey, let's, let's challenge each other and see how well we can draw one another based off of the family portraits on the wall. So it was my job to draw a picture of her with her portrait and her job to draw this picture of me. Now, I knew going into this that my sister was a way better artist than I was, but I thought, ah, how hard can it be? You know, eyes and nose, mouth, great. You know, this is good. Well, what (laughs) the result of this experiment in this art is a picture that my sister and I have infamously called the goat picture. Somehow she ended up looking like Mr. Tumnus from the Chronicles of Narnia. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. But I am not, and I am not an artist at all. But I'm so grateful. I was thinking about that, that we are God's masterpiece and that God is the artist building this beautiful picture, this tapestry of our lives. And he can take ashes and he can turn them into beauty. And I'm so grateful that God is the artist and, and uh, of my life and that it doesn't fall on me. But I was thinking about this canvas is displayed on an easel that has three legs, spirit, soul, and body. And the strongest support is that connection to the spirit. If one of these legs is unstable or unhealthy, the integrity of all three will be impacted because all three of them work together to support and hold up our life that is the masterpiece that God is designing and creating. But the spirit connection is the strongest one. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, Now may the God of peace and harmony set you apart, making you completely holy, and may your entire being, spirit, soul, and body, be kept flawless in the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. He calls you, the one who calls you by name, is trustworthy and will thoroughly complete his work in you. Friends, we need the power of God working in our lives. Just like Pastor Carl said last week, that we can take the journey of figuring out our faith, but we need to do it with God. It's the same thing that comes with mental health. We need to take God on the journey. If your body needs medication, that's okay. Take God on the journey. If your soul needs counseling, that's okay. Take God on the journey. And if your spirit needs strengthening through meditation and study of scripture and memorization and application, 
Christian, that's okay. Take God on the journey. Because God is either who he says he is or he isn't. God will do what he says he will do or he won't. And some of his promises will be fulfilled in this life and some of his promises are awaiting us in eternity. But do we know him? Do we believe him and do we trust him? Because his attributes, they aren't just things that he can do or aspects of his character, they're who he is. I'm a singer, but if I lose my voice or my ability to sing, I won't be a singer anymore because that's just something I do. That's not who I am. But God's names don't just tell us what he can do. They proclaim who he is. God embodies peace and healing and restoration and salvation. God is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. He's Jehovah Ra, God our shepherd. He's Jehovah Nisi, God our banner. He's Jehovah Sidkenu, God our righteous. He's Jehovah Shalom, God our peace. He's Jehovah Rapha, God our healer. He is El Roy E, the God who sees. He is El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty. He is our wonderful counselor, Almighty Father, everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. His names, his names say it all. That's who he is. And maybe you're in this room and you've struggled to understand the importance of spiritual component when it comes to mental health. Maybe it's challenged you. Or maybe you've embraced the spiritual aspect, but you've struggled to have compassion on people who need medical assistance, or maybe even yourself. Or maybe you're struggling in your own mental health journey and you feel alone. I referenced Paul earlier that he prayed and he asked God to remove the thorn in his flesh. And in that story, he prays three times and he says, God, please remove this. This is making life hard. It's difficult. I I can't make it with this thing. And God's answer was this, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you because in your weakness, that's where my power flows. When you're weak, then you're strong. And so I want to tell you that there is nobody who is too broken. There is nobody who's too dysfunctional. There's no issue that makes you disqualified. There's no person that God is not willing to love, that God can't use, that God doesn't have a plan, a hope, and a purpose, and a future for. There is no person on the planet that is too wounded and too broken for God. He's full of compassion. He's merciful. He's gracious. He's abundant in strength and there's no one that he can't love no one thanks for joining us this weekend to worship together with us if you've been coming forever or this is your first weekend streaming in with us we want to make sure that you know that you are family with us in fact we'd love to get connected with you and so if you would take a minute to click on the get connected uh, button or maybe you decided to start following jesus this weekend. If that's you, we'd love to have you click on the button to say, I commit my life to Jesus. And we'd love to get to know you through that and uh, know that you've made that decision so that we can be joining along with you in prayer and kind of walk with you through this new relationship with Jesus. But church, once again, thanks for joining us. We're so grateful that you're a part of this community. We love you. We'll connect soon.